We got Walker Bueller. We're going to circle back to Buffalo Trace because it's the goods, man. We're also going to talk about Freddie Freeman going 2000. Uh, we're going to talk about Shohei, Ellie De La Cruz. Yeah, Peter got the the hoss of the Buffalo Trace. Holy hell. Big one. But before we do any of that, I need the elevator pitch because we just came off of watching Will Smith tie Sunday Night Baseball in the bottom of the eighth. I need the elevator pitch for why Will Smith should be the starting catcher for the National League when phase two voting opens tomorrow at noon. Yeah, I mean, I've put it out there before. I think he's probably probably should have been an all-star at least once, probably twice. And, uh, you know, catcher is one of those positions. I think traditionally the name guys are going to be the guys that make the all-star team, the Adier Molinas of the world. And and obviously with him retiring and uh, GT Romuto is obviously one of those guys and, and, in the National League, we have Will and Sean Murphy, but uh, you know what Will's done in his career. Not many catchers have really been able to do it, especially offensively, the way he has. Uh, and then obviously defensively, he's he's improved really quickly into one of one of the best guys in baseball as well. So um, I don't really think I, I need to make too big of a case. I think he kind of does that for himself, and um, really a huge part of our team. Yeah, that's that's the big thing that I've noticed from Will Smith because Will Smith has been one of my favorite catchers now for years because I always thought that the bat was incredibly special, but he just needed some things to work on defensively. But this year and even last year too, you could tell he just keeps getting better and better in that facet, but it's not taking away from his bat at all. But you look at a guy like Sean Murphy, like Murphy's numbers overall might be a little bit better than Will Smith this season, but he's also hurt. You know, I hate to say it, but he's a little yeah. bit hurt right now. And Will Smith is playing really well. We're just watching about Sunday Night Baseball. So he right. can catch him. That race right now, I think, is one of the most competitive races between all the All-Stars. Yeah. I mean, I, I think also traditionally, obviously, Sean is with the the Braves now and, and has moved over. But but Will's never played for a bad team and, and started since day one and, and led us to, to a lot of different places. Obviously, we have... Austin Barnes as well, who's, you know, extremely talented behind the plate and, and helped Will with, with some of that stuff as well. But, you know, when you look back on it, man, it, Will also didn't really get a fair shake. You know, his first or second year was COVID. And so in terms of, oh, we've played X amount of years, like, like being a catcher, you, you need as many games as you can get, right? So for Will to play in that 60-game season instead of the 160 really shows you how, like, quickly he's improved right because it's 100 games behind the plate that he hasn't had and and so him being i think it's his fourth year it's it's been pretty incredible to watch and uh yeah he doesn't strike out he doesn't you know he hits home runs he does everything he wanted to do love it all right let's get to the goods man we're circling back on the buffalo trace the magic stuff man um this is your go-to this has quickly become my go-to it's damn good, dude. So we did it episode one. We're circling back episode nine here. Why do you love it? Just run us through that one more time. I, for what it costs times what it is, I don't think there's anything out there that really compares. I think it's probably one of the top five bourbons in the world at, you know, $30 a bottle, which is insane. And, and especially, you know, in this whole collecting and, and doing all this stuff, you get all these crazy bottles that or hundreds of dollars and, and then you've got something just as good that is the flagship product and, and therefore it's 30 bucks and uh, yeah it's hard to beat yeah so, so it's i went 30 to bucks for most it's 30 bucks for most people it's 30 yeah. bucks for most people this was 80 well because <laughs> it's also the size of my head so i go to my local liquor store and i said um do you guys have buffalo trace because walker you've given it such glowing reviews and they say, well, we only have the big bottle. I'm like, well, how big? 1.75 liters. Yep. And I'm expecting it to be really, really expensive because it's a literal airplane full of <laughs> bourbon. But they say, no, it's 80 bucks, which is still like spending $80 on liquor is still right. a good amount. That but when it's, enough, while, when it's enough to last a summer, it's going to be good. <laughs> and I want to try because I've never had Buffalo Trace before, but I probably had Not it really. in old fashions. But I've never had yeah. it just straight. So dive in, baby. Um, while we wait for Peter's review, yeah, okay, good. Yeah, that's really good. Yeah, yeah. That, that's good. Yeah, <laughs> there we go. That is good. Hey, we saw an Instagram video from you. Um, yeah. We saw a catcher in a crouch. So was that your first official bullpen? How did that first, feel, man? Yeah, first official bullpen. I guess we're two in now. I threw another one on Friday. So uh, yeah, it feels good. Obviously, you kind of slow creep up into it and. 
I've thrown off the mound a little bit here and there, but uh, yeah, 15 fastballs and, and check that box. So uh, it was up to 92. So I feel pretty good about it. And uh, yeah, we're making progress. When do, when do you start working in the other pitches? Like, is it fastball exclusive for the next month? Yeah, for a few weeks, I think. I, I'm not really sure on that. I'm, I've, I throw them in flag ground and mess around with them, just kind of tinkering it with tinkering with it a little bit. But yeah, um, yeah I think there's still some, you know, they call it like not, I forget exactly what they call it, like ligament strength, not strengthening, but kind of getting it used to doing what it has to do again. And um, you just got to get it get it strong and, and get it used to, to doing what we do. And you said you threw multiple bullpens. What did yep. you kind of progress in from the first to the second? The first one was better than the second. I think that's one thing in, in surgery that's hard to for us to kind of get used to is that there's going to be more inconsistency in, in how you feel. And, you know, you get into a five-day rotation for us during the season, you have a pretty pretty good expectation of how you're going to feel on every day. And um, with surgery, this the, the ligament in your arm just isn't used to it. So some days it feels great the next day, some days it doesn't. And um, you got to be comfortable and, and confident that that's all kind of part of it and that that's okay. So, uh, yeah, the second one wasn't as good, but, uh, you know, they could have easily been flipped around and I would have been happy as a clam too. So, um yeah, we're all good. So I think the way that a lot of people can look at that, um, because obviously not a lot of people are throwing bullpens off of Tommy John that are listening right. to this podcast, but a lot of people might be learning how to run. A lot of people might be gearing up for a 5K or a 10K. When you first start running, you may feel good on like day three, but then day four, when you try and run the same distance, you may feel like shit. Is that right. kind of like what you got going on to the nth degree? Yeah, I mean, if you want to think about it from like an actual like, you know, physical perspective, right? Like you you build all the way up to this bullpen and then that's the biggest stress that you've put on your body to that point. That's like the whole purpose of doing this thing. You're, you're stressing everything productively, right? So your recovery time is not going to be the same as it used to be, at least early. So yeah, it's, it's pretty usual for that first bullpen or the first one of the week or when you have the extra day to feel really good and then not feel as good. Um, because your body just doesn't know how to fix itself quite the way that it used to. And um, it's, it's really interesting. Like before or my first Tommy John completely changed where I got sore after I threw. So it used to be like, Oh, all back in here or whatever. And then when I came back from my first Tommy John, it was like all in my trap and all these different things. Your the muscles just learn how to do things a little bit differently when you take you know, extended amount of time off. And I, I even notice that sometimes season to season. So if I take a couple of weeks off, then I ramp back up. And when I get back in the spring training, it's like, well, last year it was all out here and now it's all in here. It just, things kind of mold and, and morph. And uh, yeah, it's all just kind of part of the process as, as corny as that sounds. And I know you noted that September 1 might be uh, the date where we'll see you on the mound for the Los Angeles Dodgers. Do you kind of have an updated timeline? Because I feel like the bullpens are happening maybe sooner than we expected. And right, we're we're not yeah, even at the I mean, end of June yet. So 10 months is pretty typically the the time you'll get back on the mound. And um, it being my second one, I would say it's pretty um, adventurous to be doing it that early. Not Not in a bad way. It's just like things have gone pretty well. So um, we're in a good spot with that. But yeah, there's, you know, there's still stuff you got to check off 12 bullpens or 14 bullpens and then some hitters and then get in a five day and do all of this stuff. So, uh, you know, the days, the days are going by quick, I guess, but um, yeah, I, you know, I want to be, be back in September. That's my plan. And, and we'll see kind of, I think where we're at, you know, obviously really tight race. I don't want to come in and try and, or be in a spot where I'm like hindering anything by me only being able to throw an inning or two or three at first or whatever it is. So um, we're going to kind of have to play a little bit of a, a teeter totter game there, but uh, you know, if they want me out there trying to get guys out, then that I'm, and I'm healthy enough to do so, then I'll be there. That's probably a great thing for the mentals that the days are going by a bit quicker because I'm sure <laughs> at the beginning they were going by slow as hell. And that has to feel so refreshing for you. Yeah, it's fun, man. It, it's interesting because you kind of get to a point, you know, I think we've talked about this before you play a certain amount of years and it's hard to get, I, I don't want to say amped up, obviously, you know, doing my job is, is the most fun job in the world. And, um, but it's hard to get that little bit of edge sometimes that you need, especially at COVID. I think we talked about that, but mm -hmm. 
you know, when you're out for a year, that, that stuff kind of starts coming back. And, um, yeah, it's fun. I don't, you know, I'm 28. And I don't know if I really can say, but I, I feel like a kid in, in that, um, you know, I, I'm excited and, and want to go and, and want to get bigger and stronger and better. And, you know, it's, it's an interesting feeling. And how do you kind of control the boundaries? Because I've always, I've always found that interesting. Like I know that you're getting healthier and healthier and you're seeing your team fight, right? Right. We're just watching them on Sunday night baseball. I know you want to get out there and you feel yourself getting healthier. Like what does that push and pull feel like? Uh, I, I try and make the trainer's jobs hard, right? I, I push and push and push and, um, probably make some of them uncomfortable and doctors uncomfortable and whatever with kind of the effort and and stuff that I do when I throw. But, um, you know, I really think it's a, it's an important thing for me to keep trying to throw the ball harder and harder and harder because, you know, I I think guys, I think less time when people have surgery and they come back and it's not quite the same is, is out of this weird, um, you want everything to feel like it used to. Right. And so, when we're right or when we're in season, it doesn't feel like you're pushing off the mound. It feels like you're just kind of gliding, right? Yeah. But it took you from age 14 to 28 of pushing to learn how to throw that hard, right? And so I think when you start playing catch again and stuff and, and oh, I just wanted to glide, like it's probably 80% of what it used to be in terms of the force. And then you guys who arm, whose arms get stuck at, not being able to throw what they used to. And, and then it's really hard to relearn that kind of stuff. So for me, I, I think trying to throw the ball hard is the only way that, that I ever really learned how to throw hard. And so that's what I'm going to do. And, and we'll kind of let them figure out how to have me do it safer or safely or whatever. But um, yeah, it's hard for me not to, not to do it that way. Well, we think you're going to be gliding again soon, man. And I, I know you hope that you'll be gliding again very soon. So Um, at the end of that Instagram video that you put out of the pen, you had a, just a quick frame, like really quick video of you mean mugging in a helmet. And that kind of sparked something in my mind. Obviously we've talked about your nuke, but you pinch ran twice in 21 in the span of like a month and a half, September four in San Francisco and then NLCS against the Braves in 21 as well. So I, I'm not going to like go to the film room here and be like, damn, like, you know, your running posture was a little upright, (laughs) but why do you feel like you were the one tapped? I don't know. I think I probably pushed for it, to be honest with you. I really do not run well. I'm, I'm decently quick, but, um, everyone has made fun of me for a long time for the way that I run. And that's fine. It's very nice. I scoot really is what I do. And my knees never get in front of my hips at all. So it's just all back behind me. It looks a little funky. But no, I think that little mean thing was I got a hit. That wasn't from pinch running. So oh, that was a hit. Yeah, that's why I was all excited. <laughs> I thought you were excited to get into the game to run. <laughs> that that reminds me of that story. You know that uh, I think the, the pitcher for LSU, he came in to hit and he convinced his coach oh, that yeah. he hit in high school and he never actually hit in high school. Yeah, well, was that maybe a conversation that you had? It was like, yeah, I'm, I'm a, I run like a six, nine 60 or uh, that's kind of slow, but I'm good enough to get on the base pass. But in reality, it's, it's much slower than that. No, we were the only, the closest I ever got to like going in to play defense was in Miami. I think it was my rookie or maybe my second year. And it got to the point where I had a glove and I had my cleats on. And they decided not to do it. And I blew up on our bench coach, kind of in a joking joking manner. But I was like, listen, man, if you ever tell me to go put my cleats on again and don't put me in a game, I will freak out. (laughs) Have you ever come come across like a crazy fast pitcher? Because I know that Dre Jameson of the Diamondbacks raced Corbin Carroll. and I heard that. Yeah. Blows my mind. Like, have you come across anyone, you know, with the Dodgers? uh, Jake Reed can really run. Really? And yeah, and his wife's an Olympian of some sort. I forget what she does, but he can really, really run. He's we've had him, you know, here and there a couple of times, and uh, he's about as impressive as there there is in terms of that. Also, a funny one for you: we do three hundred yard shuttles. That's like a very kind of well known pitcher conditioning thing. And Hunjin Ru was about as good as I've ever seen on a three hundred yard shuttle. You're lying. What? I yeah. Swear. What? No shot. Like I, my the best one I've ever run was probably in the low fifty seconds, and he would run three or four of them in a row at like fifty five seconds. 
Dude. And he's huge. Yeah, what? good on him. Is it the strides? <laughs> I feel like he may have really long strides. Yeah, he also has calves about the size of that Buffalo Trace bottle that you have. Damn, man. Yankin Williams calves right there. I love hearing that. Um yeah, so you were ready to like pull a Michael Lorenzen. You were ready to hop and write and, and hose somebody, but you just weren't gonna rip it. Have you thought about you know you didn't maybe even just... call my number? Yeah, that's ridiculous. I'm sorry to hear that. Unbelievable. Um, let's hop around baseball's big stories with you a little bit. And, and one has to do with your teammate, Freddie Freeman. Bottom of the ninth inning gets hit number 2000 of his career. And he's probably the guy that you ID, he and a very short list of, of active players that, you know, have 3000 within shouting distance. But yeah. just being around Freddie like you have, what's that guy like? Work, what's his work ethic like? Yeah, I mean, it, Freddie's kind of uh, different in the way that he's not the one that's in the cage at one o'clock every day, and and but I think he's also different in that he plays every day and and he has a routine and sticks to it, believes in it. Obviously, kind of proof proof is in the pudding, right? Where you got two thousand hits, and and he's been a really really good player in the major leagues for a long time, and um, you know he takes a lot of pride in playing every day and being really consistent, so. I think that's in today's day and age, you're going to have to be exceptionally talented, be very fortunate to be as healthy as he has been and play every day. And that, that's the only way you're going to get to 3000 hits probably again. So, um, you know, Manny Machado is probably a guy that, that has a chance just because he plays 160 a year as well. And, uh, but yeah, it's been cool. Obviously I was there for Scherzer's 3000 punch out and then a lot of Kirsch's um, stuff that he's clipped off and, um, unfortunately wasn't there for Freddy's, but, um, uh, yeah, really, really, really cool accomplishment and, and something that, um, doesn't come around too often. You know, most guys, you get a thousand hits in the big leagues. That's, that's a lot. You know, it's yeah. five, two. The, the, the weirdest way to think about it for me is like, that's 10, 200 hit seasons. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's hard to, it's, it's hard to, I guess, wrap your mind around because, at this point, like this era of baseball, and baseball has changed in recent years. So there were, you know, five, ten guys getting to 200 hits, you know, late 2000s. Yeah. But now there's, what, two, three guys a year? Right. Maybe four getting to 200 hits. So, yeah, it, that's rarefied air. I like the way you look at that. Yeah, you know? I think it's the, same, it's the same with pitching stats, right? 200 wins is 10, 20-win seasons. Like, it's crazy. It's just – what what some of the guys used to be able to do and, and pull off and stay healthy enough and, and whatever is crazy. I, I remember hearing Derek Lowe never went on the DL, which is like one of the craziest things that I've ever heard of. Damn. Damn. I always – the way we think about Freddie, it's like, you know, he's in within shouting distance. It almost seems like, oh, he's got an outside shot of it. I just think Freddie's going to get to 3,000, right? I think the bat's too damn good. He's 33 years old. He's at 2,000 right now. I don't know if he's going to have 200 hits for the next. That's, 100, that's 150 hits a year until he's 40. I mean, if there's anybody in Major League Baseball, wouldn't it be Freddie right. Freeman? The but if he wants to play till then, then, you know what I mean? Like, there's a lot of better. There's, there's so many factors outside of like, can you step on the field and get hits? Right. The the way the guys are making, like, how much money guys make at the top end of the market now dictates a lot of this stuff. I think Machado him taking the deal that he's taken the, the length of it now is a, a sign that that's like an important thing to him. Now, Freddie had already signed his deal in Atlanta and then signed with us for however many years, but you know, at 36, 37, it's hard for guys to go, well, I've done X, Y, and Z. I've made all this money. Like I'm probably a hall of famer. Like what else are they doing it for? Just for that one hit and that one standing ovation is hard. I think, especially when you've, you know, Freddie could probably retire tomorrow and he's a Hall of Famer or or pretty close. Close, yeah. So, he's like setting his record in stolen bases this year. Like he ain't <laughs> slowed out for shit. He likes those big, he likes those big bases. Yeah, he, he was. Those big bases. He, his so, swing looks so ideal and it's so perfect right now. I just don't see him stopping. Like I know that it may seem far fetched because we're still a thousand away and just getting a thousand hits, like you said, in a big league, big league career right. is amazing. But if I were to bet on a guy in Major League Baseball right now who's at 2,000, there's six active, where it's not very good comparison because guys are more ahead of others. But why wouldn't it be Freddie Freeman? Perfect yeah, swing. Yeah, you look at the at the new the new application, the DH2 is going to help a lot of guys. You think about yeah. Manny, who 
you know, first and third, obviously kind of have that little mirror thing, but playing first is a little different than playing third. And, you know, if Manny can DH for two years of his career, like that's probably another 350 hits. Like, you know what I mean? You, you start getting into scenarios that become a little bit more believable now with the DH being in both leagues. Yeah. So I figure for our video segment this week, I've got all 2,000 of Freddie's hits. I figure we can just walk through those. and <laughs> I don't just the pitches. take the ones out that he's got off of me. <laughs> um, next one is Shohei. You know he and... hit the hardest ball of his career off me? No really? way. <laughs> in the, in the playoffs, in, the, in 2020 in the playoffs, he had a homer off me in the first thing. It was like 115 or 118. He, he killed this ball. Damn. How'd you feel about that? We won. Okay. Good. That's all that matters. I like that. <laughs> Um, next one is Shohei. This guy is going into play on Monday, the only qualified hitter in baseball with an OPS at a thousand or higher. And, and he's fourth in punch outs. And you just yep. watched him, I'm sure, in, in the freeway series this past week. It, like, what do you feel as another player in LA when you watch that guy play baseball? Well, I mean, I, I think first I love all the rumors swirling that he's going to come play for us. I think that's a, that would be a good deal for everyone involved. It, it's basically already congrats. He's your teammate. Exactly. Yeah, it feels like that a little bit, doesn't it? But and it's um, only going to cost you six hundred billion dollars. <laughs> yeah, I know. God. But I don't know, man. It it's an interesting thing. I, I think the only downside to a player like Camry is you you spend that money, and the guy stubs his toe, right? And then you, you've not only lost your number one or your number two pitcher, right? You've lost your three hole hitter as well. And, you know, just if you look through how many guys get injured, how many guys are on a single team every year, like that guy counts as two or three guys. And so it's like that little weird, like diversify your asset thing. Obviously, I would love to play with him, and I, I think he's an unbelievable player. And I'm really trying to poke holes in anything. Here. Like that's the only downside because he's obviously exceptional on both sides of the ball. And, uh, yeah, I, I don't think we'll – I don't think we'll ever see anyone like him again. And we obviously haven't before. You know, I think Babe Ruth is like the one that everyone talks about. Like, Shohei has not has been here around the same amount of time as I have. Like, he's well surpassed what Babe Ruth did pitching. Like, Oh, yeah. Um, so, it's interesting. I mean, the, the Florida kid, I guess, everyone wants him to be the next one. You know, we'll see how good he is on, on either side. Like, I don't know. It's really hard, man. And, you know, the name that keeps on coming up with Caglione at Florida is Brendan McKay. And McKay was really freaking good. And he was probably big league caliber in both. But Yeah, but McKay was kind of, uh, I want to say, because it, it's a comp. he was like so refined on both sides already. Mm -hmm. that I think it was kind of known that there was a ceiling that he was like pretty close to. This mm. the Florida kid, it's like, he had a five year. I saw the other day. It's like a five or six year in games that he walked more than four. It's like you're throwing ninety seven from the left. Like you probably shouldn't be walking four in games, right? Like uh, with and then hitting, obviously, you know, he can hit, but like refined or being polished typically means you're just closer to your athletic ceiling, right? So uh, I think Otani has that weird ability where. He's so athletic that I, I don't know if we've seen the ceiling of everything he can do. Like we've obviously seen him do a lot of things, but the 200 inning thing, can he do that? Like now you're putting him in, in the conversation of like elite level pitching while he's also hitting 40 homers. So you're like super nitpicky. I mean, if he was, if he was average on both sides of the ball, he'd be one of the more valuable players in baseball, right? Like if he was worth two war, pitching and two war hitting like a good player he's worth four and a half war four war like it's crazy i think uh something that i find interesting about like people are putting dollar amounts on otani right they're like what is a dh worth that's hitting 40 home runs and has a thousand ops but then what is a pitcher worth who throws 180 yeah. innings and strikes out 200 guys and then you put those two numbers together and that's what he's worth but you also got to well, understand we, marketing and the market. That's exactly what I was about to say. We at, things like that. We were at the World Baseball Classic and the show that yep. was Shohei Otani. I mean, the amount of people that were filling into the stadium just for a chance to take a picture yep. from the nosebleeds. Yep. 
the jersey sales. Like baseball is a business. So you might as well just tack on 10 million more a year just to get him <laughs> in the building. And I, then I remember you all those things. I remember when I was in high school, these teams will come in and you'll have dinner with the team or whatever. And I met with Boston before the draft when I was in high school. I asked him about uh, Dice K. Matsu, was it Matsuyama? Matsuzaka. Matsuzaka, yeah. Yeah. And uh, I was like, did you guys know? He, like, everyone said he was going to be really, really good. And this was like a couple years late. Too. This was 2012. So he was kind of, Take he rate. wasn't winning Cy Youngs, you know? Yeah. And they were like, listen, we, we knew he'd probably be a three or four in the major leagues, but his contract was paid for the moment he signed it. Yep. Like, what do you mean? He's like, we sold so many jerseys and so many of this. And I think it's awesome because it, this is a global game that we play, right? And you look at the diversity in baseball now, and it, we can obviously get more more of this, that, the other, whatever. But um, there's always been a, a superstar from over there, at least since I've been, or, you know, been watching. And it was, you know, Nomo and Matsui, and I played with a few guys and, so I, I think it's it's cool that the, the torch has kind of been passed now. Ichiro, I forgot. I don't know how I forgot him, but like it's a global game, and and to have them involved, there's a huge business side um, element to it that that the average fan probably doesn't think of. Quick aside: if the opportunity is presented to you to be a part of the WBC roster mm-hmm. uh, next come around. Is that something that like you have on your baseball bucket list or not? Necessarily? Yeah, I would love to. I, I got to wear, I got to play for Team USA for one week in college. So I left the Cape, went to Cuba with the team, then went back to the Cape for the playoffs. And it was one of the cooler, cooler weeks I've ever been a part of. We had, we had four guys from my college team on that same team. And, you know, you just meet these guys from all over and it, it's really a cool, cool experience. And, and I, you know, I guess, it, I got to think it's like being at an all-star game for two weeks, like yeah. the all-star game and being in that locker room is some of the coolest times or, or coolest experiences you're going to have in this game. And um, to be able to do that for an extended period of time, I would love to. Now this year was the first time I've ever really heard of it, but when they cut on you a couple of times, you're hard to ensure, but we'll see. I would love to go do it. Got you. Um, all right. Jump into Ellie De La Cruz and then a rise to, to wrap that. Ellie, like, I'm not sure if you were watching on Friday night. It was one of those where I was keeping He's close awesome. tabs, like, as it kept on going. And I was looking at ticket prices because, you know, Indy to Cincy is hour yeah. 45. I was like, all right. You know, it's it's Smith Shaver who I'm intrigued by. It's a chance to see Ellie live. It's like, holy hell, 75 bucks to get in the door? I'm not doing that. Yep. So I didn't do it, and I have immediate regret. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what were you feeling when when you saw that? freakazoid do what he did on friday well i mean it, it's the second time in what three shows that we're talking about him like yeah th- there's something too that we're talking about tawny all the time and then we're talking about this kid um we got to talk about crazy him man he's got this he's got this sneaky ability to you know we've all especially when you're growing up playing minor leagues and stuff you see guys that have like these flashes of things that other people can't do but he seems to have those along with like looking like the kid that played shortstop at Vanderbilt for three years too. Like he's refined with this like ceiling thing that happens. And and I don't know if we've seen somebody quite like that in a long time. You know, I, I think Mike Trout, but even I think more like a Cunha, like that. Yeah. Level, like yeah. Freak athlete. It, the electric. I mean, Mike is as crazy an yeah, athlete true. as you'll like ever see. Like, <laughs> yeah. Um, but even both those guys, there's like some weird stuff that happens every once in a while. Trout will go into slumps that like his swing says that it should never happen. Acuna like gets swing happy or makes some weird decisions sometimes. Obviously, he's done pretty well against me, so it's hard for me to say anything. <laughs> but but he does, right? You'll see him sw- you know, pop up to the infield in the first pitch of a game and stuff like that. And this yeah. De La Cruz kid just seems to have this feel, this poise and this feel of – of a guy that's played six or eight years already, right? He he plays like Freddie with like the tools of of Otani, right? Like that's kind of what he's doing, and that's why it's kind of weird. It's cra- we haven't seen anything like that. Yeah, six foot five, beating <laughs> out grounders to first base. 
I mean, what the hell are we even talking about here? So I mean, I mean we'll see what happens in three years when they give him his money and whatever. Tatis <laughs> was like that too. You know what I mean? Tatis but was Tatis doing Tatis crazy things like that. Thing. Do what? Tatis is still doing his thing too. I mean, he's de- developed into one of the best defensive right fielders in the entire yeah. game. Yeah, I mean, it took a while on the suspension and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. That's a good point. <laughs> um a hey, last last headline i want to hit here is Luis arise because you know 400 is so unique and you know everybody wants to talk about ted williams you know even go to like a tony gwynn people are making Luis arise to tony gwynn comps right now we enter play on monday with louis with louis louis arise yep. hitting 399 that's 71 points better than anybody else yep and there's something about the era that he's doing it in you're a really fucking good pitcher. There are a lot of other really fucking good pitchers. Right. For him to hit 399 right now in this era of really fucking good pitchers, yeah. how impressive is what he's doing? I think it's even more impressive that he's doing it his first year in a division because he doesn't know these guys, right? Like, yeah. he hasn't faced, you know, Sonny Gray. He hasn't faced him 50 times. Like, I faced Charlie Blackman 50 times. He knows what I can do, what it looks like, what it, when I'm good, what it looks like, when I'm bad, what it looks like. He just he's just walking in there and hitting getting hits off guys like they're they're pitching machines and they're like high quality, you know, major league caliber pitchers. It's it's crazy to me. I, I remember somebody asked me about that like, "Oh, there's this crazy bet, uh, you know, that he'll hit 400." I'm like, "Listen, man, maybe in a year or two, like but not his first year. Like you're crazy." And now I look like an idiot and I don't like that, but <laughs> it is what it, it, it's just a wild kind of throwback thing. And I mean, I guess to bring up Ichiro again, like that's the last time we've really seen this kind of thing that I can think of. Mm-hmm. Uh, or even yeah, had the belief that a guy could do it. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm thinking like batting title of recent years, you know, you played with Trey, you know how talented Trey Turner is. And that's a guy that, you know, is consistently near the top of the batting title. But, but Jack, to four, Walker's point, Trey Turner goes from the Dodgers to the Phillies and has struggled in the early goings, and exactly. that's going over to a new division. And look at what Luis Arise is doing at four hundred. Exactly. It, no, so I mean, like, I think Trey is the is probably the other active guy that you ID, and it's like, oh, he's flirted with consistent batting titles, but he's never been three eighty. He's never been three seventy. Yeah. Like, this is just a crazy number that he's getting to. Yeah, my boy Corey Seager's getting a little something going down there too. He's hitting like 350 down there. Mm-hmm. Dude rakes. I love Corey Seager. I'm the <laughs> biggest Corey Seager guy. I love him. <laughs> no, um, I mean, it, it is interesting in this in this day and age that we kind of have a guy that's doing it the way he's doing it, and and you know it's fun to watch. It's a, it's a cool thing. It's something kind of new. Like oh, the guy went four for five again, and it's back up to 400. Like. I think everyone's kind of like rooting for it in a weird way, except the team that he's playing. Like, Right. No, I, I mean, think, like that in Miami too is awesome. Yeah. Aram, Aram made a really good point um, on a couple podcasts ago. He said, is, is Luis Rice chasing 400 more impressive than Aaron Judge breaking Roger Maris' 62 home runs? And as a Yankee fan, I'm biased. And I was like, no, Aaron Judge, cooler. You know, it's home runs. But the more I think about it in this day and age, for him to be able to hit 400 with also moving in the division, which is such a great point that you made, I think it's more impressive. Like, yeah, it's, to me, the home run record thing has always been you have to be great on X amount of swings, right? Like, mm. you have to be great and strong and big and talented and hit the ball out of the park 62 times. Obviously, not many people have ever been able to do it. But to hit 400, like, you have to be well above average for 180 days. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, like, when you, you even can, look at that. No, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I was no, just like, gonna... guys, have, guys have hit 10 or 12 homers in two weeks. Like, they get hot and they hit homers and whatever. Every ball they touch is a homer, right? Like, that's never going to happen for a full season. To hit 400, it's like. It's so crazy. So it's like having a sub one as a starting pitcher. Exactly. It's the Bob Gibson thing. You're good every single time you're on the hill. And, and the most interesting thing to me about the Maris year in 61 was he started really slow. 
like the first month he was, I think four or five homers. And then he was 24 and 38 days or 38 games. And like a hot stretch gets you back on pace Yeah, with 400. If if you start five and three for five back to back days, it's 300, not 400. Mm -hmm. Like great day. For everyone else, three for five is a great day. You're chasing 400. You go over five and three for five. You're hitting 300. Like I'm just looking at the stat leaderboards right now. Ronald Cunha Jr. is hitting 328. Luis Arias is hitting 399. There are three guys right now with 24 or more home runs. Pete Alonso is 24. Otani and Matt Olson are tied for the lead right now at 25. Yeah. Like they're they might have 30 before the All Star break, or at least close to that. What's the OPS difference? What's what's Arias OPS? Nine forty. Arias is top five in baseball in OPS. Interesting. He slugs a little bit. You know, we were talking about that. It's it's a big outfield in Miami. Have you pitched at that new Miami ballpark? I have. I've been awful there. You know what? I think that meme that you that is from my Instagram that we were talking about earlier. I got a. I hit a double in Miami in that. Hell park. yeah! Because you I know it's a huge outfield. Trump. It's not a bandbox, baby. It's a big outfield. And I think that yeah. he he racks up these doubles, man. And like he's yeah. pumped out a couple. Like he slugs a little bit too. So 940. It's yeah, so- that's surprising to me. Mm-hmm. But if, so- I mean, if you're hitting 400, though, your on base is at least 400. And you're Slug. slugging at least 400. Like, right. If you hit 400, you can't really OPS below 800, I wouldn't think. Yeah. It's, it's yeah, so- I mean, like, if you hit nothing but singles, yeah, you're you still OPS 400. like eight hundred. You're an eight hundred OPS, so it's all yeah. it's all uphill from there. It's it's so Crazy. fucked up to go to Otani's page, and when I'm just looking at OPS guys, and like I have to go from pitching to hitting when I look at a three one three ERA, and then I'm like, oh, he has a higher OPS than Luis Rise at a thousand, and I'm just like, dude, this guy is. Like, how is he not worth $70 million a year? How is he not worth it? I don't care. I'll pay him. I don't care. Uh, I want to wrap with Walker Buehler, the actor, in these BMW commercials that I was watching. So I I came across – actually, no. One of our – Ethan, one of our social media guys, came across the BMW commercial you did with Tim Anderson, Pete Alonzo, Ozzy Albies, and that was the choreography one. Um, And and (laughs) – we may clip this and, you know, slap it on a social video, but you were part of like a, a dance number with T.A., with Alonzo and with Ozzy Albies. How did that come about? Were you part of the choreography or did you just I have no kind of recollection of what you're uh, I have no <laughs> recollection of what you're talking about? Is it the bourbon that that is forcing yeah, no recollection or is that? But it's Buffalo Trace's fault, but I don't remember anything that you're talking about. OK, let's jump to the next one then, because I think you were doing a good Brick Tamlin impression with Nestor with Ozzy Albies and Byron Buxton in the car. You know what I'm talking about? I do. I thought I did a great job. I thought that I hit the lines perfect. I thought I was most efficient of the four in terms of nailing the lines, getting them out. Um, I thought I did a great job. Who was the least great job? <laughs> Who was the um, least TA had a tough time the first year. We, he had some weird lines, though. So I don't really – and Byron Byron had a tough time with some, but he had some weird ones too. It's interesting. You show up to stuff like that, and, like, even the easy ones are so uh, out of character. Like, it's just not stuff that we would ever say. And so you get that, and then there's always one guy that theirs are, like, way harder. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of funny to sit there and just, like, watch that self-doubt and implosion come off of come into like extremely talented and confident people like it feels like a group presentation where you and your buddies just can't stop laughing yeah it it's hard i will tell you there's been many a take in the two years that i've done that that are just everything's perfect until one of us laughs It, it is a it is kind of a it's a horrible it's an awful an awesome thing to do is to go shoot a commercial with like some of your peers. Like it is very fun, but then you start getting mad at people because it takes too long. Like then it's like us versus them. Like, you know, we all start telling them, no, that was perfect. That was as good as I could do it. Like, 
So yeah. I don't know. It's a it's a cool experience. Working with them has been cool. Um, but yeah, I don't I don't know if I'm you know a great actor. I really don't think so. But I can recite lines pretty good. I can get it done. I think that's acting. <laughs> that's good. Um, last one before we let you go. Have I? I was thinking about this on Sunday Night Baseball. Dieter Rule is so good at his job. The the ballpark organist at Dodger Stadium. You ever given him a wreck? No, no, no. He did the he does the little Ferris Bueller thing when I pitch, um, like the chicka chicka thing. You know what I'm talking yeah. about? Yeah, they do when I strike somebody out at Dodger Stadium. That plays like okay, the chicka chicka. Yeah, that thing. Every time. Uh, he does that for certain guys. I know for Gonsolin, it's now like a meow thing because he loves cats and stuff. Yeah. Kind of but <laughs> uh, no, he's he's incredible. And it's not – that doesn't uh, – they don't do that everywhere anymore. You know what I mean? I think that used to be a huge part of it. And, like, that was just kind of a, a normal thing in a ballpark. And obviously in L.A. we kind of hold some traditions really – really tight and and i think it's a it's a really cool part of of our you know ballpark experience i guess all right walker bueller you are the man thank you very much love the buffalo trace and we'll talk to you next week sounds good i have enough for the summer thank you buffalo trace (laughs)